Um, okay, everyone. So, uh, hello. It's good to be here, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, there is not much really I can say about, about myself. I am a Stone Age-inspired animist. Uh, I, arrived, uh, I arrived at this position after years of exploration of different pre-Christian traditions. I guess I just wanted something more uh, more direct and more more raw, and um, and something something more simple. So there isn't there isn't much to it really. Uh, today I'd like to I'd like to show you a different perspective on continental Celtic worldview, using sources completely from outside of of Gaulish contexts uh, from coming from mostly from the northeastern fringes of Europe. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at the objectives uh, for our uh, for our uh, for our today's meeting. So our objectives for today are to introduce a shared cosmological background characteristic of hunter gatherer cultures in Eurasia and the entire circumpolar area. In Europe, this geographical common ground is what we call the big game corridor or the uh, pre-boreal and boreal hunting grounds stretching from the Pyrenees throughout the entire uh, European plain all the way into Western and Northwestern Siberia. Uh, we will introduce some common mythological base for the circum circumpolar uh, for, for, the, for the circumpolar region and tie it together with the cosmological model associated with that. We will also draw some analogies between those shared elements of spiritual landscape and continental Celtic beliefs. And finally, we will take a shot and in interpreting two well-known and beloved Gaulish deities uh, to either try to reinforce or question the current state's state of knowledge uh, about them. So I do realize what I will say might be a bit confusing at times, uh, but I'll do my best not to be the guy in the picture. And I promise you there is a logical order to it and eventually it'll all fall into place. So, uh, so bear with me, uh, pun intended. Uh, so let's first take a look at, uh, at our tools. Um, so we, uh, in our journey, we will heavily rely on ethnoarchaeology, uh, which allows basically to examine archeological record through analog analogical inference. So by comparison uh, to more contemporary cultures and populations of whom we uh, know more and from whom we can borrow contexts, uh, contexts for artifacts, practices, and so on. Uh, to get that context, we will look at societies maintaining a nomadic or semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle uh, in conditions resembling Upper Paleolithic or Mesolithic, Mesolithic Europe. Uh, Next, um, next in our toolbox is uh, folkloristics. Um, we will look at two types of tales or, or two types of myths that match the geographical area that we are interested in. And we will examine how they relate to the hunter-gatherer worldview. Uh, they will provide, uh, provide us with uh, protagonists for our story today and outline the trail we will follow on, on our, our journey. Uh, also the tools that I mentioned here, so the ATU index and the Thoms uh, Thompson's Motif Index of Folk Literature, uh, these, are, uh, these are very useful tools when it comes to, when it comes to researching mythological uh, motifs. And I will have them linked in the, uh, uh, in the reading list. Uh, that will be attached to the video uh, to the video later. 
Uh, all right. So uh, why is folkloristic so important for us? Um, uh, well, folkloristic anal analysis is crucial because it allows us to see how stories changed and evolve in time, how they spread geographically, how they create offshoots and how they influence each other, basically creating a solid narrative for what we, uh, for what we want to accomplish today. Uh, so um, let's uh, let our first hint uh, on what we are looking for come from Tacitus and his, uh, his Germania. So uh, Tacitus, uh, Tacitus provided us with a good description of a lifestyle that we are looking for in contemporary cultures to get some reference for interpretation of archaeological record. Uh, used to illustrate our, our case. Uh, he described the tribes of Fanny and he also mentioned Helusi and Oxiones. So about the Fanny, he says that they, they don't use metal, they don't build homes or domesticate animals. Uh, they have an egalitarian social system with shared duties between genders and subsist mostly on game and foraged wild plants. Uh, which matches the profile of a hunter-gatherer tribe, basically. And uh, the Halusi and Oxiones are a little bit more enigmatic. What he mentions here is that they are basically half-beasts, half-human. So let's take a look a little closer at that. Uh, so here's when etymology comes into play. Uh, while we know from later sources uh, that the Fenni uh, actually referred to the inhabitants of Lapland, not the Finns, uh, we need to dig a little bit deeper uh, to understand the other two, two tribes. Uh, so their names appear to be derivatives of animal names. Uh, totemic clan patrons, if you will. Uh, so it is the elk for the Halusi and the bear for the Oxiones. Uh, this interpretation is supported by examples from different languages, as well as archeological finds that point to the significance of the elk and the bear uh, for the peoples of Northeastern Europe, where environmental conditions and model of economy allowed for continuation of culture based on close relation with undomesticated nature, which is, which is very important to us. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at the first uh, shared and very uh, archaic myth where the elk and the bear appear. Uh, in the cosmic hunt myth, the Ursa Major constellation is interpreted as a hunted animal. It is interpreted either as elk or a bear, depending on the exact location uh, we are looking for. So different peoples uh, identified uh, this, this asterism with a different, uh, with a different animal. Uh, in different versions, or versions of this myth, the animal is chased or finally caught and killed only to be reborn next season. Uh, it is a great example of an asterism uh, to be used as a mnemonic tool to represent a narrative uh, to be passed on to next generations, connecting, connecting the skyscape and the, and the landscape. Uh, this, the variants of, of this myth are indeed very widespread in the entire circumpolar uh, area. And uh, this myth is characteristic uh, for the northern and central Eurasia and both Americas. This is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the mm, uh, uh, oldest myths that we can identify. Uh, by its by its spread and the number of different varieties and versions that we can that we can identify. Uh, so uh, the, the difference is this, that in Central and South America, the protagonists are of course not elk and bear, 
but are swapped for local, local species. So this reinforces the idea of totemic tribal identification uh, based on the interpretation of this constellation as, uh, as, as an animal, either bear, bear or, uh, or elk in our case, uh, depending on location. Uh, evidence for the presence of variants of this myth can also be find, found in Central in, uh, and Western uh, Europe. And this is, where, what, this is what brings us to a very interesting case. So a good example uh, illustrating the significance of both, both elk and bear uh, comes from, uh, from Northwestern Poland where a 9,000 year old Mesolithic sanctuary was discovered. Uh, one of a kind of discovery really. Uh, the area contains um, a model of the Ursa Major asterism surrounded by sacrificial, sacrificial deposits. Uh, and I really wish I could go more in depth here, but with our time constraints, and it's, unfortun it's unfortunately not possible, but this is a really interesting case. Uh, so apart from the sacrificial deposits, which clearly, ident clearly point to the, uh, the ritual significance of this place, uh, another important aspect is uh, the location of this, uh, of this sanctuary. It was located on a sandy, sandy shelf on the, uh, on the shore of a, of, of a lake, uh, which on clear nights would provide the viewers with uh, with three scenes, ref uh, the same scene actually locate, uh, reflected in three different places. So we would have the original constellation in the sky. We would have the, um, uh, the representation of the constellation on the ground. And there was another constellation reflected in the uh, surface of the water. So as a result, um, it is the oldest known site relating to the idea of the cosmic hunt uh, in the context of a threefold model of the universe. And this is, this is 9,000 years ago. Uh, so the threefold model of the universe is common in the circumpolar area. And it is also known in Gaulish cosmology, as, as we know. So the division of reality into the realms of sky, land, and sea uh, can be observed in many cultures and, and locations uh, where the hunter-gatherer lifestyle was maintained throughout the Neolithic, Bronze, and, and Iron Ages. Uh, the places where land met the water and where the sun could be observed in relation uh, in the relation uh, to the water uh, seemed to be of particular importance uh, to the people back then. So that's where we can find the majority of, um, of rock carvings of petroglyphs in, uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, the scenes that dep depict mythological scenes or cosmological con concepts. These are usually located uh, by, the, by the waters edge. Uh, so the, these places were most likely considered the ultimate liminal spaces, where all three realms would meet and where the domains of gods, humans, and spirits would overlap. And those places, cosmology and myth recorded in rock carvings would be translated into into real life uh, through, through ritual. Uh, the spirits and gods would be contacted for both wisdom and support. And uh, there, uh, those were the places, the transitional points that marked the stages, uh, the stages of, of human life in a symbolic form as well. So for a more detailed uh, model, of, um, of, uh, of the cosmos, we can turn to the Evenk people of Northern, nor Northern Siberia, uh, whose, uh, whose model shows, the, again, the clear division into the sky where the spirits and the sun reside 
uh, with the sun or the sky fire, the concept of sky fire uh, being uh, reserve, as a reservoir of the unborn souls uh, is contained, uh, and the land which constitutes the material world and the water which was inhabited by the souls of, uh, of, of the dead. It was basically the concept of the, of the underworld. And the underworld. Uh, so in the Evan cosmos, there were two ways of crossing over to either the upper of or lower uh, or lower world. Uh, world. Uh, it was either by traveling on the cosmic river, uh, which was sometimes understood as uh, as the Milky Way, uh, depending again on the exact location and the exact tribe that we're talking about, or along the trunk of the cosmic tree. So a very similar uh, version of, uh, uh, a very similar division can be uh, found among the cats, also North, uh, Northern Central Siberia. Uh, here, the cosmos is also divided in three parts with sky, land, and water, uh, with water constituting the underworld. Uh, additionally, the cats provide us with a description of different parts of the self, uh, which is also threefold. So uh, here, the self is divided into the body, uh, the, what they call the body soul, so the vital energy that powers the body. Um, and uh, the free soul, which is part of the collective soul of the species. So the free souls are considered masters of the respective species and embody the characteristics of the animal in question. And in, uh, in cat cosmology, the free spirits can be asked by a shaman as an intermediary between humans and the spirits to grant them the skills or abilities of the animals of the desired, desired type. So at this point, uh, I guess we could say that there is a certain cosmological framework emerging here. So within the threefold universe, we have uh, the water walking sky elk uh, as the intermediary between humans and the spirits including those residing in the underworld, uh, himself uh, capable of revival once killed, basically immortal, and the bear, uh, who in turn is the chief of the uh, spirit, uh, sp uh, um, the chief uh, spirit, sorry, of the uh, animal uh, uh, animals and governs the world of mad nature with its cycles, acting as a mediator between uh, humans and animals. So uh, now that we have established the possible shape and order of the northern hunter, northern hunter, hunter gatherer universe, let us take a closer look at the two main actors in this cosmic theater, starting with the bear. So the beginnings of human bear relationships are not really, not really clear. The earliest archeological finds in Europe pointing at the Paleolithic uh, have been identified in Drakenlock Cave in Switzerland and in Montespan Cave in France. Um, but in the first instance, instance the uh, unnatural arrangements of cave bear skulls uh, was, was found uh, pointing to possible ritual activities. In the second case, in case of Montespan, a clay figure of a bear with a cave bear skull probably attached to it at some point was unearthed. Unfortunately, the common theme of these two uh, finds, of these two compelling sites, isn't the hypothesized Neanderthal cave bear cult, as it is sometimes suggested but rather um, amateurship of the dig crews, lack of proper knowledge of those in charge of those digs and lack of methodology and documentation of the finds. And as a result of this poor methodology and poor, poor documentation, uh, scholars frequently question um, the nature of both of these, uh, of both of these sites. Uh, they question the, the legitimacy and significance. 
uh, because they are simply they are simply not uh, not documented and uh, scrutinized well enough. Uh, some more reliable uh, signs of significance of bears to the inhabitants of what was once Gaul can be found in cave paintings and engravings in other locations. Uh, there is a notable concentration of bear-related art in the Pyrenees, uh, where the belief in human bear kinship is uh, very much alive, even, uh, even today, as well as a curious cluster uh, on the southwestern slope of the Alps, uh, where the Voconti tribe used to reside and who left us a considerable number of bear-related inscriptions. Um, the significance of the bear to hunter-gatherers and other peoples living of the land most likely came from the annual cycle of bear activity and hibernation. The bear would emerge from its den in the spring, heralding the return of the, of the sun and abundance of, uh, of food sources. It would consequently follow the sun's path in the autumn uh, falling, falling into this death-like slumber, hibernation, only to be reborn next spring. Uh, when we take a closer, uh, a closer look at the diagram of bear activity, we can clearly see the two, two seasons, summer with positive energy balance and winter where the, this energy balance is negative. And while the bear would only be around in the sort of a, uh, to use a, a Gaulish analogy, the Samos part of the year, the elk would stand against this cyclical order. It would remain active when the nature would die in the winter in the Giamos mm, uh, half, of, uh, half of the year. Um, in the, in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, uh, before agriculture, culture, the revolutions of the Ursa Major constellation would uh, correspond and be identified with the annual activity cycle of the bear of its uh, birth, death, and resulting rebirth. So the bear embodied the changes of the energy system of life itself. So if you want to look for signs of bear cult um, in Europe, um, looking at the sky might be at least just as, if not more effective uh, than delving into dark, dank caves. Um, one such example um, is the Finnish folk bear calendar. Uh, shared by other Northern Eurasian peoples as well, uh, like the Komi, for example. Uh, the calendar is divided uh, in two uh, by bear days. So the points of death of the bears when the bear, bear falls asleep, uh, which, is, uh, which is the October winter nights, and uh, rebirth of the bear in, in April, uh, which is uh, the holiday of summer nights. Uh, with the summer half belonging to a uh, summer half of the year belonging to the bear and the winter half uh, belonging to the elk. But it is worth noting in this case uh, that uh, both transitional days are being called called bear days, which points to the prominence of this uh, Ursine patron. Uh, among uh, among the people observing this uh, uh, this calendar, so uh, the birth association with life and rebirth um, would not end with the spring revival of nature. Also, among the Finns, as well as other. Uh, other northern peoples, we can observe the tendency for the bear claw and bear tooth amulets to be worn exclusively or predominantly by women. Uh, 
we can see this in in grave finds uh, from uh, from Russia, from Russia as well, especially from the place uh, called uh, Olenny Ostrov, and uh, the majority of of uh, bare body parts, jewelry, and and body adornments uh, were uh, was found in the in the graves of uh, in the graves of females. Uh, so the, these Iron Age bronze bear claw pedants that you can see here in the uh, in this in this picture uh, used to be worn by women in Finland for both protection and as fertility amulets. So with a, a pair of pendants symbolize, symbolizing two paws, five claws each, and with the microcosm of the women's menstrual cycle reflecting the grand cycles of of nature. Um, so uh, these uh, bear related, uh, bear -related uh, amulets are not the only ones that we can identify uh, as connected with uh, 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 with female uh, with female bearers. So uh, in the more distant past, and we're talking about the Upper Paleolithic, uh, bear related amulets uh, were not the only form. Uh, the figurines we know as uh, the Paleolithic Venuses, uh, Venuses were among the most popular female amulets. Uh, they have always been portable size, easy to carry from one, one place to another, and while we could speculate and Scholars, scholars do that uh, as to what their function was. Um, we can use the fact that every hearth, pretty much every hearth in a mammoth hunter's camp had one, uh, often kept with care and, uh, and attention, usually in a, in a special niche uh, designed for that, for that purpose. We can use that to look for clues as to the to the meaning and the purpose uh, of these figurines uh, among the uh, more contemporary uh, com more contemporary populations. So the peoples of northern Siberia have kept uh, their ways for longer due to the slower climate changes, and the Evang people, for example, also keep a female sculpture in every tent, symbolizing a female ancestor guardian. Among the Chukchi, uh, it is customary to present the bride uh, with a wooden doll, also representing a guardian ancestor, to keep watch over the young woman's fate and ensure her prosperity and, uh, and protection, also, uh, also in, in childbirth. Uh, looking closer to home, uh, in the Balkans, we can come across another type of Venus, uh, as, as they're commonly, commonly called the Bur, uh, Bur Venuses of the Vincha culture, uh, so mostly the territory of, uh, of, mod of, uh, of today's uh, Serbia. Uh, well, the, the bear women of, of Vincha culture represented, um, uh, had the form of, of, of women with bear heads or uh, wearing bear masks, holding new, newborn human children in their arms. So here, the associ this association with, uh, with the bear, uh, of the bear with the childbirth, uh, with bear giving woman is particularly strong. And some other more contemporary practices, uh, sort of reinforcing this association, are placing newborns, newborns on bear skins for protection, uh, which were mentioned in, by Porphyry in uh, the third uh, century, century AD. And this is also a, a, a custom, uh, custom now in some uh, in some parts of the, of, the, of Europe. Uh, notably in, uh, notably in uh, Romania. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the new mother was given a Shiber, a Shiber nickname, like in Lithuania, when, where they are called Meska for a female, for a female bear. 
so um, in many cases among northern peoples inhabiting the circumpolar zone, we can come across mythological motives going one step further than that and directly claiming uh, bear ancestry through the union of a human woman and, uh, and a bear. Uh, one of the peoples where these stories are present are the Kanti, for example, and some, uh, some, uh, some Sami groups. It is also uh, present in some parts of Finland, uh, especially, especially Karelia, as well as much close, closer to Gaul in the, in the Pyrenees among the, among the Basque people. So um, Western Europe also has its own, its own variant of this kind of a story. Uh, so the tale of the bear sun is a separate type of its own. Uh, it, is, it can be identified in its many forms uh, in different uh, parts of the circumpolar zone. Uh, in this story, a young woman meets a bear in the woods whom she particularly fancies. She joins the bear in his cave and after some time, a child is born of this union. So half human, half bear, equipped with his father's strength and his mother's wisdom and knowledge, mm, the little bear uh, ventures out to the world once the opportunity for that arises. And in other variants of this tale, it is actually a she-bear who shapeshifts into the first woman and gives birth to the first half-bear, half-human, who in turn becomes the ancestor of humankind. So again, depending on, lo on exact location, we will encounter different variants of this, uh, of this uh, tale. Of course, uh, the belief in human bear union was uh, very much alive throughout uh, human history, including, uh, including the Middle Ages. Uh, some of the greatest heroes uh, that we know from legends like Beowulf or King Arthur traced their roots back to Ursine ancestors or uh, carried some, uh, their names carried some Ursine uh, etymology. Uh, there seems to be a common theme of a bear-like hero embarking on an errand to defeat evil and bring back prosperity. Uh, to the uh, to the people and the land, making making friends on the way, forging alliances uh, as they get closer to their final final battle with the with the with the, with the antagonists. Uh, a similar motive can be found in the in the story of the bear's son, uh, who encounters the uh, four spirit spirit helpers on on his way. Uh, he offers them help uh, demonstrating mm, demonstrating kind heart in the process and also also wisdom acquired from his mother and the grateful spirits uh, award the bear's son with with amulets with pieces uh, uh, with pieces of uh, of of their body of of with with tokens that allow uh, allow the the little bear to shape shift into uh, into other animals, into this, these animal spirit forms, a skill that will prove invaluable uh, to the to the little bear very soon when he comes face to face with uh, with the villain of his story. Now, uh, when it comes to male bear figures in the Gaulish context, um, there aren't many examples. Um, one we can identify from an actual inscription is Arteos, of course, uh, mentioned as an epithet of, of Mercury. Uh, whether this is a separate entity is a subject of debate, of debate among scholars, and there are different interpretations here. Um, 
and so is potential sphere of his influence. So uh, by, uh, by proxy of Mercury, it is often identified as money making, money making and plenty. Uh, but still, uh, from what I have seen in the in, in the academic in the academic sources, there is there is still debate going on about it. Uh, uh, a bit of a different. Uh, it is a bit of a different case when it comes to female bear uh, figures. Here. Uh, uh, strictly in Gaulish context, we have we have two, and uh, one of course is Andarta, attested in seven inscriptions left by the Voconti tribe, who also, as we as we recall recalled, happened to inhabit um, this area where a number of bear cave uh, paintings uh, were located. Uh, and the material associated uh, with the, the great she-bear, as her name is, uh, is uh, often translated, doesn't give us many hints as to her possible sphere of influence. Another example is, uh, is of course, the very well-known Artio, uh, known from just two inscriptions, but we have more context here. Uh, one is one uh, one is uh, one inscription is from Trier in Germany, and the other one uh, from uh, Muri in Switzerland. Now, while the inscriptions themselves don't give us much to work with, as well, we have a certain clue as to the Artio of Muri. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, figurine, this uh, this sculpture was. Uh, uh, was supposedly once located in a Roman garden, which may point towards uh, her domain as a goddess of abundance, uh, abundance of, of nature. So given what we have discussed about the uh, archaic roots of the bear cult in the Northern Hemisphere and how they can reflect on uh, on this uh, shared uh, this shared body of of myth and shared body of beliefs, uh, uh, it is my opinion that it is safe to assign the following attributes to Artio or or Andarta, uh, the guardian of the natural world, its cycles of death and rebirth, its abundance and plenty and an intermediary between humans and the natural world, keeper of the covenant between humans and nature, patroness of women, childbirth, childcare, and education, an uh, uh, ancestor deity, mother of humankind and its heroes who, serve, uh, who safeguard humanity's survival, and a cultural ancestor, who espoused the ways of the bear and taught humans how to survive in boreal and subboreal climates by respecting the natural order and adjusting to local conditions. Um, so we still, uh, I hope these resonate, uh, resonate with you. And as far as I am aware, they are in line with what is usually believed about uh, about uh, about Artio. So I hope nobody is is, is offended by it. Uh, next, uh, we still have to discuss the other essential figure in this version of the cosmos. So the elk. As we recall, the elk seems to stand in opposition to the bear and doesn't obey the laws of, this, uh, of the cycles of nature and remains active both in the summer and in winter. There are also other characteristics of the elk that are significant to his role in the universe. So let's, uh, let's move on. I believe this antlered figure in uh, the pictures uh, here requires no introduction. So the image on the left is believed to be the oldest known representation linked directly to Celtic god uh, Kernanos. While it is notoriously hard to date 
the Valka Monica petroglyphs. They provide a wealth of information amassed between, uh, amassed between uh, the early Bronze Age and the Middle Ages. Curiously enough, a similar, a similar images containing the same attributes can be found in other places far away from the Alps, like the image um, on the right, which is from, from Utah uh, in the USA. While possible connections remain a mystery between the, the two images, there are clues suggesting common origins of both. So antlered figures can be found all across the world and uh, also outside of the circumpolar area. Here are some examples of uh, starting, uh, some examples of, um, of these figures, starting with uh, the, the, the famous uh, sorcerer of the Three Brothers Cave in France. Uh, two examples of um, Mesolithic, uh, Mesolithic images from Spain. And for comparison, an image from Mesolithic India. Uh, it is a popular opinion uh, among scholars that these images represent either deities or sorcerers in trance on their journeys to the uh, to, to to other to other worlds. Uh, another type of representation of a spirit journey is riding an antler, antlered steed. Uh, here we can see an, uh, an assortment of images uh, ranging from contemporary Siberian on the upper left, uh, actually painted by a Nenets, uh, Nenets shaman, uh, through Mesolithic uh, Finland to Bronze and Iron Age Sweden, Sweden and Norway. Uh, the role of the elk as a, as a vehicle for crossing the boundaries between worlds doesn't stop here, though. And that's because uh, the elk, or rather, we should disambiguate a little bit here, elk in European understanding, so in the American version, a moose, uh, is uh, mo the elk or moose are excellent divers. As our ancestors in the pre-agricultural era based their notions of the world on direct observation or relations between its elements, it is not surprising that the elk or rather the elk's antlers came to represent, mm, represent a boat which allowed to cross the waters of the underworld quite easily and safely. And I apologize for the quality of this picture. It is not easy to find a good image of a diving moose. Uh, but when paired uh, with what is considered the missing link between the animal and the representation of the boat, I hope it, it does its job. So the motive of the elk boat is common in uh, Northern European rock art. Uh, here are some more examples of uh, images symbolizing an underworld bound elk boat. Uh, elk, deer and reindeer antlers can also be found as grave goods of individuals frequently identified as intermediaries between their communities and the spirit realm. Uh, so I realize the word the, the word shaman uh, is uh, should be used specifically for the uh, for the Siberian context, uh, but frequently in in in, in academic uh, in academic uh, papers we can uh, we can encounter the word shaman being being used in more in, in a broader con context. Uh, so here, here are the examples. Mm, the first two examples are from Denmark. And uh, these uh, um, quote unquote uh, shaman figures uh, had antlers, uh, antlers, antlers laid below the head and shoulders in this, um, in this case. In the next case, we can see the antlers uh, placed, uh, uh, placed uh, under the shoulders and the pelvis sort of as, as if they were supposed to carry uh, that person 
to the after to the afterlife. But we also have examples of such Mesolithic burials uh, from uh, from France. Uh, here is uh, here is one example. Uh, unfortunately, this is the only representation of this um, of this burial that I was um, uh, able to identify. And there is also one more uh, from Brittany. And uh, in the French uh, in the French context. Uh, the antlers were placed around the heads of uh, of the uh, of the buried uh, of the buried remains. Uh, of the buried of those buried uh, remains. All right. So the use of uh, the use of bear skins uh, and deer skins. Uh, to uh, to ensure the secure passage uh, to the to the afterlife, uh, it's uh, it's another way uh, of uh, another way of doing it that we can see in uh, in the archaeological record. Uh, so wrapping the bodies of the deceased in elk, deer, or bear skins uh, survived. Uh, survived until, in some cases, until the uh, 19th century uh, in some, uh, in some uh, areas like, uh, like Karelia, for example, uh, particularly uh, gnar gnarly practice, uh, as we can see, um, but nevertheless quite popular and, uh, and, uh, and quite widespread. There are also accounts uh, from uh, uh, from the area of the Yenisei River in Siberia of boat burials in which a dugout canoe would be fashioned uh, and painted with blood of a slain uh, of a slain elk. Uh, the body of the deceased would be wrapped in the raw hide uh, with the antlers still attached, and the uh, and the uh, this canoe uh, with uh, with the, with the burial gifts uh, would be sent down the river uh, to be taken uh, to be taken to the ocean uh, to, to be taken of the of the ocean, which, as we remember, is associated with the underworld and the uh, and the residence place of the uh, of the dead. Uh, Placing antlers or hide on the grave of the shaman is still a common practice in northern Siberia. Uh, and so is burying the bones of the animals whose meat would be uh, uh, used for the burial feast. Uh, and uh, this way of communion with, this, with the animal spirit uh, is uh, Supposed to grant and uh, and and secure safe passage to the to the underworld as well. Uh, in the in Sami myths or in the in the Sami uh, cycle of myths uh, about deer people, uh, the wrapping uh, the wrapping in animal skins is supposed to guarantee rebirth. It's supposed to guarantee rebirth as part of uh, of the animal kingdom, as part of the land. And here we can see an interesting case of a uh, of a Sami burial mound, uh, which is located on the lake shore. Uh, as we mentioned before, this is a significant this is a significant location uh, where the sky, the land, and the sea, and then the water. Uh, meat uh, and there is also an antlered uh, and antlered figure guarding uh, uh, guarding this burial mound visible there on on the top. Uh, so uh, it uh, so it wasn't uh, so carrying individual souls. So the afterlife wasn't uh, afterlife wasn't the only ability of the elk. The elk could also carry the very soul of the uh, the very source of the souls with him. 
Uh, and this brings us back to the story of the uh, story about the uh, about the bear's son. So as time passed, the little bear uh, the, the little bear uh, traveled further until he came across a, across across a, a homestead uh, where he met a young woman. And obviously, the little bear falls, falls in love uh, and wants to wants to take the girl take the girl with him. Uh, the girl unfortunately cannot leave uh, because her old father, her old immortal father, held, uh, holds her captive. And it's, and it's not a coincidence that I used the image of the acted girl here uh, with, her, uh, with her outfit with the sun disk uh, located in the uteral uh, area. As we remember, the sun is the symbol of the source of the soul, it, uh, the souls. It is the, it is the symbol, uh, it is the symbol of life. It is uh, the life-giving force. Uh, just like uh, just like a young woman in this case is the one capable of creating, uh, creating new life, bringing bringing new life into the world. Uh, so, um, as uh, as they talk, as the as the little bear talks with with the girl, she reveals a plan to him that uh, may work in uh, that may work to find uh, to find uh, how to kill how to kill the the old the old elk who captured who captured the sun. Uh, the girl suggests that the, uh, the little bear should shapeshift into a form that allow, would, that would allow him to uh, that would allow him to hide, so that the elk would not see him. And then the girl would ask the elk to uh, as to what would make him mortal again. Uh, and so the bear uses one of the tokens that he got from his uh, spirit uh, spirit helpers. He uses the leg of an ant to transform himself into an ant, hides himself in the bushes, and uh, the, uh, uh, the recipe to kill uh, the elk is revealed to him. Uh, so this notion, uh, this myth of the uh, deer or elk stealing the sun is also quite widespread in the in both the uh, Eura in both Eurasia and North America. So the deer is thought to have stolen the sun. Uh, it's either on autumnal equinox or winter solstice, to uh, and to restore fire and to restore light. Uh, a carnivore such as a uh, lion or bear, it is usually, uh, it is uh, a lion frequently in, in Northern America, uh, uh, needs, to kill the, needs to kill the deer or the elk. And then the sun is returned, returned at the vernal equinox or summer solstice, depending on the, depending on the location. So here we can see some more examples of a uh, combination of the symbols uh, of the sun and the elk, as we mentioned before. So the image of the sun boat is another popular one in uh, in uh, in uh, the north uh, in the north of Europe, and uh, it symbolizes it symbolizes uh, this um, the, the kidnapping of the sun by uh, by the elk in its earlier forms and in later form, forms of course it is it relates to uh, a slightly different concept as you can see some in some cases these these sound boats appear in twos so um, this is a uh, this is a reference to uh, this is a reference to the divine twins but we will get to it in a moment uh, so, uh, as a curiosity, we can mention that the uh, sunship can also be found in Canada, 
uh, in uh, southern Ontario, we can uh, find uh, we can find a place called Teaching Rocks in local language uh, that contain uh, several images several images of uh, sonship. And uh, as we can see in the in the diagram here on the on the right, uh, the uh, the idea of the sonship. Uh, covers the entire circumpolar zone. There are, of course, some some gaps, uh, but not all areas are uh, are well uh, re are well examined yet, uh, well researched. So I'm sure more will uh, come up in the future. So let's come back to the let's come back to the birth uh, sun and what happens next. So we know that uh, that the girl and the birth son eavesdropped on the uh, on the conversation with the elk, and here's what the elk has to say: For me to die, the challenger will have to battle with my brother, who is a shapeshifter too. So this brother will appear as different as different animals, uh, but again, we can see a. a, a Mm, an environmental relationship here. So the bear's son transforms into carnivores and the elk's brother uh, tra uh, transforms into, uh, into herbivores. So uh, while the bear's son trans transforms into mountain lion, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, elk's brother appears as a porcupine and so on and so on. And eventually, uh, eventually, the brother uh, will appear as a snake or a dragon, and this what makes uh, what makes the uh, the elk mortal again. So there are also examples of uh, there are also examples of snake or dragon people in the in the rock art in the Stone Age as well, and you can see them. You can see them on the right. Uh, and moreover, uh, this uh, idea of elk and serpent duality can be seen in other, um, in other uh, uh, images we will get to in a moment. So the concept of, uh, of the divine twins is very well familiar to us, uh, I assume. Uh, we know the Asvins, uh, we know the Dioscuroi, uh, and we also, uh, we also know uh, another example of divine twins, also mentioned by Tacitus, with whom we started. So uh, amongst the Naharvahalians um, is shown a grove uh, an ancient grove over, uh, over which a priest uh, who is apparelled as a woman presides. And this grove is dedicated to a twin, uh, twin divinity named Alsis. So we see a clear, uh, we see a clear uh, reference to the elk uh, and the, the idea of Twinship or duality in this uh, in this particular in this particular case, and also this image uh, that you can see that you can see below of an elk boat and a snake or a dragon boat, uh, also from Stone Age Finland, is uh, I think it's pretty curious uh, given given the most uh, popular image of Kernunos that we know, this one. So, uh, so uh, given what we have, what we have uh, discussed so far, uh, I would be compelled to offer the following, uh, the following interpretation to Kernunos in the light of uh, in the light of this uh, circumpolar, uh, circum circumpolar cosmology, mythology, and the dynamics between the bird and the elk. 
uh, a psychopomp, say, psychopomp responsible for ferrying the spirits of the deceased to the underworld, the ultimate pathfinder capable of traveling between worlds and planes of existence. Uh, the patron of all those who venture out in search of riches, as he is the keeper of treasures, including this greater, greatest treasure, immortality, and another great treasure, which is the sun, the source of the, sor the source of new life. And dual deity of liminal spaces, intermediary between the material world and the spirit world. And again, I realize it, uh, is, um, it is largely in line of what we, what we already know about Kernunos and what, uh, what we already assume about, uh, about Kernunos. However, uh, I think it was, uh, it was an interesting idea to look, at, um, to look at him through the lens of a different uh, of a different uh, different cultural uh, cultural experience. So we come full circle. Uh, we come to the end of the cosmic uh, of the cosmic hunt. Uh, so in the cosmic hunt, we can see the uh, the reflection of uh, of duality of uh, of the cosmos. Uh, the constant cycle and constant struggle between life and death, uh, gender polarities, and social di 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 dichotomies, as uh, as Bereskin uh, Bereskin words uh, words it. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope um, you found this presentation interesting. Uh, I hope I managed not to not to offend anyone or not to uh, not to speak some kind of blasphemy. Uh, and uh, yes, I I have uh, some more ideas uh, coming soon. We haven't explored these topics in full. Mm, there are there there are more interesting motives that could be linked to uh, to the Gaulish system of beliefs in there that we can explore. And I hope I will have an opportunity to present them to you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Biroki. That was fantastic. We um, we actually don't have any questions, but we have a lot of praise in the chat because that was an excellent presentation and you covered such great topics. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. I am happy to answer, uh, answer all questions that you may have. Uh, Later on, you can you can of course find me find me in Gold Chat uh, if I'm if I'm needed. Just drop me drop me a message. I'm open to direct messages. So any questions that might arise, uh, I will I will I will gladly answer. And of course, um, uh, of course, there there will be an extensive bi bibliography attached to uh, attached to the video uh, after it is uploaded uh, after it is uploaded uh, to YouTube, so you will be able to actually examine the sources yourself if you would like to delve into the topic a little bit deeper.